I think those are your glow in the dark shoes. Yeah, they were. I didn't know they were glow in the dark until the power went out on stage one night. <laughs> yeah. There were creepers I bought in England that I found out they glowed in the dark like during an emergency. <laughs> People followed, follow me off stage, boys. <laughs> Oh, Joe, you're handsome. Yeah, I know. These pictures make me think, um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is, what the fuck happened to us? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Dick, uh, Dick, we used to be in a band called The Cheapskates, and me and Nate wanted to start a band. We kind of were in high school, we were kicking around a high school band, and we loved The Cheapskates. We thought Dick was like a kid we really looked up to, you know, and we asked him if he'd sing for our band, you know, and I don't know why he agreed, because, I mean, like, he was sort of older, more experienced, you know, like, had kind of been around Boston, had some bands people liked to go see, and then we were like these high school kids that, like, had never even stepped foot on a stage, you know? Got a horn section in the band. Started playing around Boston. We were t we were really we really were bad, you know, like because me and Nate were like scared little high school kids, and Dick used to have to try and make up for it by sort of being overly confident. But anyway, people started coming. You know, it was like really exciting. Like I remember the first time we played the Paradise in Boston. I remember saying to the lighting guy or sound guy, I was like. I said, um, hey, what's the capacity here, you know? And he goes, he gave me this like, why, why do you care about what the capacity is tonight? You know, there are, there are 80 tickets sold for the show or some shit like that. But sure enough, kids lined up and we sold out the Paradise. And that was like, that was the, such a big thing for me at the time. I was so excited about that. That got me excited about like, whoa, we did that. Now what else can we do? And you know, it was just really fun. And When the band was built, I mean, everything we did was deliberately to go against anything that was popular. You got to think of, of the, these ridiculous plaid outfits when, when you know, uh, Use Your Illusions 1 and 2 is coming out. You know, I mean, it was like this fucking teased out hairspray shit. We, we had buzz cuts and fucking bow ties on. People thought, like, the fucking circus was in town when we come out of that band. <laughs> 500 fucking guys. And, yeah, shit faced and the whole world might be full. Make sure no one's fooling you. Don't let them play you for a fool. You'll be sorry if you do. Sure, the whole world might be full. Make sure no one's fooling you. How about the hair? First off, I will play the rest of it. Do that, do that. Okay. One, two, three, four. One ball, a handful. idea of like band gets song on radio and sells a lot of records is something that happens all the time. It's really not that special, but the Boston's the work that we did between, you know, 1990 and say 1996 or 97 when we were fortunate enough to have a song on the radio. It's like <clears throat> we had built, you know, a really special following in cities all over America. We had toured successfully in Europe and it was really Done Lollapalooza, Lollapalooza and, you know, it was it was really on the strength of just our own thing, you know, like we had made the transition from independent label to major label, but, but still, the major label didn't even know how to get involved with what we were doing. And we didn't, we didn't really want them to know where we were, were on tour. We used to call ourselves like we were referred to ourselves as the pirate ship because they would like try and find us to get us to do things. And we were like, don't answer the phone or like, you know, we were just out there, you know, fucking shit up. People as far as the eye can see, and the biggest names in music standing on the side of the stage, looking at us like going, "What the fuck is, are these guys doing?" Every once in a while, we would we would have a really big opportunity, and we would inevitably blow it. <laughs> we were not an easy bunch to work with at all. <laughs> You know, we're getting, we're regrouping to do the hometown throwdown in Boston in December, which is, 
you know, this will be hometown throwdown number 10. So I don't know. Seems we did like nine of them. Nine of them, and then we took a few years off. Four years. Four years? Yeah. Like four year break. I have I have such bad OCD that having an uneven number of throwdowns <laughs> has caused me to walk around in circles for the last five years. The, the throwdown was just, it was awesome. It's a, uh, it's a series of uh, five shows in, that we started doing in Boston a long time ago. Five shows at a small club. We haven't played a show in four years and it's, I don't the know. The one we decided to do. The one we decided to do. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, I mean, People were offering us hundreds of dollars to play, <laughs> to do other shows. I mean, they, the numbers were... There's no other reason to do it except for that it's going to be fun, and that was the whole idea in the beginning. I'm really excited about it. I really am. I'm nervous as fuck. We were touring a lot, and I was approaching 40 at that time, and... Um, and we, I, well, that's why we took the time off. I, you know, certainly for myself, speaking for myself, is I it was too much on the road, you know. And I wanted to, I wanted to stay home or, or whatever uh, home was. I didn't. It was just too much time on a bus. So I said, you know, as I was approaching forty, if there's anything else I can do, now's the time to find out, you know, because. You know, 40 will turn to 45, 45 will turn to 50, and uh, I don't know, I don't, I, don't, I don't feel like at 50 I'd want to look around, but, but maybe I will, I don't know. I didn't. So, you know, I said, well, is there anything else I can do? And then it took me about a year to realize, um, no, no, there's nothing else I could really do, and I, I, was, I was born to be a boss tone. Operated somewhere over the past five years. For the young kids out there, step by step instructions on how to set up a drum set. Not how to play the drums, but how to set them up. I want to know. Factory, I think. No, I'm kidding. It's the steakhouse, right? <laughs> We're in lovely North Hollywood, the Valley, if you will. There might be a porn going on right next to us. <laughs> in fact, there might be a porn in the same building. It's like an inch of dust on everything, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is it. This is the first time we've gotten together and played in, uh, Jesus, I don't know how long. It's been years. Has it really been that long? Oh, my God. I haven't played ska guitar in four and a half years, except to, uh, except to amuse guitar students. <laughs> the last year I managed a hotel. Yeah, I decided to try something completely different. My friend owns, owns a hotel and he gave me a, a job and ended up being one of the managers, which is pretty crazy, but I found out quick that I hated it. <laughs> Don't tell him that. I had a good time, but... Can you uh, send more towels up to 419? <laughs> No, it was more like making complicated reservations for people I didn't give a shit about. I like that, Lawrence. That wah or whatever it is. I do a little teaching, a little producing, writing, and recording. Here I am today, I'm a captain flying corporate jets. My interviews. I worked for the airline. I was actually a pilot for the airline before I went corporate. And yeah, every interview, they want to know what was there before flying. and. You've got to tell them, and it's actually the reaction is unbelievable. It's kind of like, are you kidding? Why didn't you put that on your resume? And you're like, dude, you'd, you'd see that on my resume before meeting me. You'd be like, yeah, right. <laughs> Luckily, an old friend, Jimmy Kimmel, gave me a call and said he's looking for an announcer on his TV show. And I said, oh, that sounds like um, hell. But the people that work there and the people that uh, he hangs out with who are now you know, my friends and the guys I hang out with out here, 
were very, very cool people, and, and I and I liked it. I like being there, and I like I like being part of that show. You know, these 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 Kimmel people aren't Hollywood douchebags. He had I made a ton of friends. I got offered a job working at Side One Dummy as sort of A and R slash staff producer person, and I did that for two years. And I sort of transitioned out of the job job world and back into no job. <laughs> Which is nice. Hey Phil, will you get me Greenberg on the phone? Thanks, babe. <laughs> it's nothing like this. <laughs> on this uh, production, I am the travel coordinator. And I went to film school when I was around your age. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was kind of something that I always really wanted to get into. Um, then, you know, me and Dickie and Joe and Joe and all, you know, we started this little punk rock band that started to take off. And I abandoned the movie business and we started, you know, our, started touring around. Um, so when we started, you know, when it became apparent that we were going to, walk a little bit away from the band and everybody wanted to take time off, I thought that I would, you know, try to get back into it. This is uh, the director's trailer, as you can see, as it says, Durr, on here. So this is a real deal, I'm not just making this up. Hi, Katie. I did some stuff with the toasters, just played, played with those guys for about, oh, about a year and a half or so. And then I was just like, because they were they were traveling all the time, and I was just like, I can't I can't travel anymore. You know, I gotta I gotta stay home. I gotta be you know somewhat somewhat grounded. So I got myself a got myself a little job, and you know me and the dog, my girlfriend and my mom, and chill at home, yeah. play you know play a little bit on the weekends. But this is this is gonna be fun. I get to see all I get to see all the guys again. This is I haven't seen a lot. I haven't seen. You know, Thank you. Thanks, Joe or. Joseph Royce, Dickie, or well, anybody. I haven't seen anybody in a long time. You look exactly the same. <laughs> What's, going What's going on? Good. Yeah. You look good, man. Oh, I'm trying, man. I'm trying. <laughs> hey, what's happening, oh, man? Yeah. How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. When was the last time I've seen this site? Uh -huh. well, five, five years. Five, six, <laughs> years. Yeah. Wow, man. What? It's a while. <laughs> Sick. It's called uh, Don't Worry Desmond Decker. Even though in the song we say, Don't worry, Desmond Decker's doing fine. Uh, but he's actually dead. One, two, three, four. I'd like you to key in 1997 behind me so this all makes sense. Expecting from the throwdown, well, I, I'm hopefully not expecting to drop dead of a heart attack. It's been four years since I've done anything like this. What I'm expecting to get out of it is just to see some old friends that I haven't seen in four years that were a huge part of my life that aren't in my life anymore. What comes after that, no one knows what to expect. Uh, we're taking this as the throwdown and just and try to live in the moment and just enjoy it for what it is. And, and hopefully survive. Never hid the fact that I was a Yankees fan, and I, I never will. And uh, they really didn't, I don't think they knew that when, when I came in, except when I came in one day during rehearsal, wore a Yankees hat, 
And I think everybody just looked at me just like, what are you doing? Do you have a problem? I was like, oh, hey man, I'm a Yankees fan. I can't, you know, can't deny that. So that's, that's, that's it. I, I'm trying not to rub it in their faces though, you know, the fact that, you know, we've got 26 world championships. With the interlocking NY, yeah, that's, 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 that's what it's about. That's weird. Austin may have been here. So much was made of Dice Cat. I think this is going to be a really good game. We're watching um, the greatest baseball team ever assembled play the Cleveland Indians. Pitching, hitting, all around. Just know how to get it done. The Cleveland Indians, by the way, are the team that eliminated the New York Yankees. <laughs> yeah, this is Chris, he's lucky he's in the band. <laughs> he's a Yankees fan. It's unbelievable. I took a, I took a lot of crap, you know. Get it, make sure you get a shot at Chris for putting him in the band, for, for allowing him to be in the band. I, from my friends, I lost friends because he's such a damn good trombone player because he's a Yankees fan. Yeah, I think we're ready. I think we're ready to go. <laughs> Ready to enjoy the game. Yeah, I wasn't properly prepared for this game. So. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're ready to go. Chris, you want to do some singing? Is there any score or anything? No score. No score, but Bottom I, first. Dice K looks unbelievable. Why are you wearing Yankees for job? Uh, because, uh, because, you know, I, I heard some Yankee stuff going on. I figured, you know, I'd just bust it out. Suit up. All right. Well. Okay. <laughs> Time to go, Gracie. <laughs> she just ran into the damn thing. <laughs> this is over, we're over in the beautiful Silver Lake area. This is a dog park that Gracie enjoys. And we're heading to the practice space. What we've been doing is the four of us have been rehearsing. And uh, me, Joe, little Joe, and Lawrence. And uh, the four of us have been rehearsing. And, it, and it's really been solidifying that, you know, so that now when you add the icing, that is the horn section of the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, it's gonna be a pretty, we're, be, we're putting together a pretty solid cake right now. Crazy Drive, I wanna talk. Well, all those cats live all over the place, you know, like uh, Johnny Vegas, I know, lives in Florida, and uh, Chris Rhodes is out, out in Connecticut, and Roman's uh, another part of California, so us four here, you we know, we're, we're close, you know, we're all living in Los Angeles, believe it or not. Am I going the right way? Yeah, so you know, we're getting the rhythm section down, and then later on the horn section's gonna come in and uh, add all the flavor to the songs. Those guys. My sister was telling me she heard audio of uh, Dustin Pedroia in the dugout yeah. yelling at everybody on the bench, come on, motherfuckers, put on your goggles, it's gonna be a fucking laser show. <laughs> oh, that's fucking <laughs> so awesome, dude. <laughs> and then he goes out and gets a fucking laser. Yeah, he's a motherfucker, that guy. 
It is unbelievable. It's gonna be a laser show. That dude's my hero. I love that kid. I dude, he's him. like literally my size. Yeah. Five seven hundred sixty pounds. Fucking insane. Crack. Well, let's decide what we're gonna do. Oh, hell of a hat. Hell of a hat. Good, good one. Good. I'll drink that. Sound good? Yeah. Could be a little peppier too, right? Oh, I remember what I did. I went. That song, Do Something Crazy, was about a, a girl. I think I was like, yeah, I was about 20 years old, 20 or 21. Um, we were young, and uh, I, I dare to say in love, or what we considered to be in love at the time. But uh, um, it was about one night she hit me in the back of the head with a beer bottle. Because I, uh, I had deserved it. Now that we're actually playing the music, it's, I don't know, it seems a lot more real. Like, it took a lot of work to get, you know, everyone on the same page and ready to do it, but um, now it's just sort of the nuts and bolts and, you know, doing the work to get the show up to where it needs to be, you know? So that's that's been really fun, play, actually just playing the songs and not stressing about the details at this point, but just more looking forward to the actual performance and getting in this rehearsal space and doing it. It's my neighbor, Jose. <laughs> hey, keep it down over there. I'm getting less and less nervous, which I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. I, I, I feel like, uh, well, I didn't know, you know, I hadn't even, I hadn't so much as listened to those songs. And now I'm singing them again and getting comfortable with them. And I use the term singing loosely. <laughs> yeah, we're starting to play the songs, just for sort of rhythm section and Dicky, and then the horn players will be coming out at some point fairly soon. And it's, you know, it's been it's been work, but it's been really fun. You know, it feels good to play play again, and I don't know, not talk about playing, but actually play. I guess that hell has been freezing, and yes,
Kimmel. I'm the host of the show that Dickie now works on, and we're out front of Dickie's dressing room. This is it. This is the glamorous uh, room where Dickie puts on his snazzy suits and his snazzy ties every night. Come on, let's take a look. This is it. Um, you can see there's a lot to see in here. <laughs> it smells like my grandpa's basement. Oh, I want to show you something. These are some of the shoes that he'll be wearing on the road to the throwdown. I don't know if, if Dickie mentioned this, but he was born to be a Boston. When, um, when he came out of the womb, he burst out of his mother's vagina and he started screaming the knock on wood. Never had to knock on wood! And he was smoking too, which I thought was a weird thing. Let's see what else is here in the uh, ties all over the floor. He's really a slob. When he says throw down, he means throw his clothes down on the floor for someone else to pick up. Say, Dickie, we, I was telling you before I pour the camera heat up, we're gonna throw throw in a party, and I mean you're invited, you know, to work. You know, he's a great bartender. He puts, he does that thing where he sticks the napkin to it. You know, he told me that's his move. And uh, then he tried to lay claim to the guy. Also said he was the guy who invented putting the foil around baked potatoes. And I said, no, nah, no. Nah. You know, a lot of times like British singers will sing, and it just sounds like you don't hear their accent. Or like American singers will sing and it sounds a little Britishy. With him, it's not a Boston accent as much as more like a it's more of like a a monster act. If there's a monster accent. I first met them. We used to do a show after we did a show called The State. We did a show called Viva Variety, and we had them on, uh, and they did the impression that I get, and it must have gone pretty well because we've been friends ever since, and for a while the saxophone player, uh, Tim Johnny Burton, dated my sister. Mm. So it was a fortuitous meeting, I guess, for uh, all of us. Uh, and then I've, I've become, you know, one of those people who, uh, I actually am such a big fan, I, I, I know, obviously I know all the songs. I can play a couple of the songs, yeah. um, but I also know uh, if you have the live from the Middle East uh, record, I also have all the banter memorized. I actually have all of Dickie's stage banter from that album memorized, like, dude, get your feet on the floor. You almost took Dennis out, and if that happens, there's trouble. Um, and uh, the part where he talks to the kid in the tweed jacket. See, this is where you start to sound, when you start talking like this, now I'm gonna start to sound fucking crazy. The first time I saw him was at the first throwdown that they did at the Middle East, and uh, I was like 15. Walking down the stairs, I just remember just like freaking out, just like not knowing what to expect, goosebumps, and just like, <laughs> oh my God, this is actually happening. And to my friends, like, oh, we're going, we're doing it, we're doing it. And then, uh, and they were so cool, like, they were always hanging around, like we got there right, you know, when they opened the doors, and they were always hanging around, you could kind of go up and be like, oh, hey, and run away. Yeah. Stuff like that. And um, and then when they played, I just, the, the crowd, the whole atmosphere, I just couldn't believe that stuff like this happened. And it was just like, everybody just went nuts. Kids were just like pouring on stage, jumping off. I was holding all my older friends' stuff, their wallets and their hats and their glasses while they were in the, in the crowd and stuff. Because I was too scared. They're like, you're going to go? I'm like, no, I don't think so. They're like, all right, hold everything. And then I didn't see them for the whole show. For, for me, having grown up, you know, going to shows in the Boston scene, they were the first band to take, in my eyes, from my personal experience, to take ska music, punk rock, and hardcore, and mold it all together. And, and, and the shows were frenetic and sweaty and communal. Everybody was united. And there was stage diving and, and massive circle pits, walls of death, just like gang sing-alongs. I mean, these are some of the best shows I've ever seen. I mean, just frenetic, crazy, crazy energy. All right, all right. All right, all right. Hey, I want you guys to know 
And after all the years of watching the boss going through my life, I always thought that it wasn't a problem to play in a suit. I want to tell you right now, that ain't right. It's about as hot as you can get up here. And I think, I think right now we're about to heat it up. You guys think you can handle it? Yeah! Here we go. The first show I've ever seen him uh, just made me instantly say, I want to do that. And I want to be on that stage commanding a crowd like they do. This will be so hard to follow. You must be the, They just, it, you could see that it was legitimate and 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 intangible their love for what they were doing and, and they were just all in. You know, like they gave everything to the music and, and they, they were always all in about giving back to other Boston bands or, or giving to charities or speaking out against racism. You know, they also taught us to, you know, to help out the band behind you, you know what I mean? And and, and, and put your money where your mouth is. You know, a lot of bands want to say that stuff, but they actually did it, you know what I mean? They took, you know, I mean, just to take bands like us and the Royal Crowns out, it was, you know, they could have got far more popular bands at the time to put more heads in those rooms and get more money on the back end, but they did the right thing. And, and I think we've tried to do that in, in, in retrospect uh, as we came along, you know? So I think they, I think they set a, a good tone on both the underground level and when they became, you know, nationally prominent, you know? What? Not be the word here to the you know, there's no street dogs if there isn't a mighty, mighty Boston. Mike and I, like, uh, being from the Boston area, know what the Boston's getting back together means, especially in that area, if not the world over. We knew the shows would sell out at Middle East. You know, we knew all, if they announced shows, they were gonna sell out quickly. But uh, when they announced the, the Providence show, uh, we had this, me and Mike uh, bet our, you know, cause it's a big, big room that they're playing in Providence. and. Me and Mike had a bet with our, our guitar player said, he said, oh, it'll sell out. But me and Mike were like, it's going to sell out like in an hour or less. Easily. And, uh, and, to and Toby, our guitar player, was like, no, I won't sell out in the first day. So that turned into Joe the Kid telling, telling Gittleman and Dickie, Toby says that, uh, you know, the shows weren't going to sell out. So Toby's been getting phone calls from Gittleman saying, like... That's a fucking bunch of bullshit. To Toby's been getting <laughs> phone calls. That's Toby that. right there. I he didn't... doesn't believe in the Boston. I didn't say bullshit. I said <laughs> it may take more than a day for the New Year's Eve show to sell because those... Fuck you guys. <laughs> there's definitely a buzz around Boston, and um, the only way I can compare it is if there's a really, really bad blizzard and you get on the subway or the, the bus, you know, you can talk to a complete stranger and be like, man, it's cold outside. And the person will just start a conversation with you and it's totally natural. It's almost like that with the Boston's getting back together. People can just go up to each other and go, did you hear yada yada? They're also doing a show at Lupo's. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's just a natural buzz conversation that's going around the city. I think the best part for like a thing like the Throwdown is how the, the fans can kind of make it more time to spend together, you know what I mean, and be hanging out for a whole weekend. And, you know, and just especially like um, to do it around Christmas, you know, it's like, unless you're an asshole, you're probably in a good mood around Christmas, you know? And it just, it just makes it that much more special. And uh, I think there's always a good, you know, good anticipation. Everyone's in a good mood and you get to, you know, make make a week of it or whatever. And I think, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of those Boston fans are so diehard. I'm sure they're going to be at multiple shows, you know, so I'm sure it's sold out, but I'm hoping maybe doing this interview will get me in the side door for the ticket. <laughs> oh, look at your MySpace page. What? I thought you had to fight the pussy off. No, look at that. What, what, that With would, a stick. That would be attractive to girls. <laughs> plaid and dogs and shit. Tartan patterns are always huge pussy lures. Do you want to lick this? Favorite boss tone song has to be either Rascal King or Let It Be. Um, I've never understood why the Boston's haven't played in the past five years. It makes me uh, angry. It makes me uh, uh, confused. Uh, I, I honestly wish I knew why. I would understand if like if like Dickie had like a weird like Bobby Brown like crack problem and 
or like Ben or, or, or Joe Gittleman or was, was like getting a sex change or like some crazy shit was happening. But as far as I know, they just, uh, they've just been lazy about it. I, I, I'm against this reunion. I don't understand it. I think Dickie has plenty to work on here at the show. I mean, as you can see, he's got some cleaning to do in his office, and yet he's off running around with these guys. I always said to Joe, I said, it's only a matter of time, Joe Gittleman, the baseball. I said, it's a matter of time. I said, I said you guys are great live band, and that's, and that's something and unique in that world and, and your music, and that's something that always, that'll carry you. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, and uh, I think it's great. You know what I mean? I think, uh, I think the music world needs bands like that. You know what I mean? Um, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of new bands and a lot of songs, but not a lot of great live bands and they're a great live band you know and i think that's that's important boston. fucking boston massachusetts bro <laughs> the middle east we're outside the middle east queuing up in the freezing cold in boston on boxing day waiting for the first show Welcome back to Boston. This is the throwdown, man. Night number one. It's been four years since they played. You know what I'm saying? This shows me insane. It's insane. I am having a, a really hard time. I took the tea yesterday, and I had my jacket on, and I had my Yankees hat, and the guy walks past me and goes, You're a loser! <laughs> and just keeps walking. <laughs> This is Newberry Street. Me and Dick used to come up and down here. We used to make flyers for all our shows. We'd get Elmer's glue, and we'd glue a flyer to like anything, any flat surface. Mailboxes, parking signs, anything. Because we were using Elmer's glue, they'd stay there for years. Me and my brother have been getting into the Boston's for about 15 years now or so. I've been listening to them since I can remember. <laughs> you can tell them a hundred times what it's like, but until they feel that wall of music just nail you, you don't know, have any clue what it's like. Live show is just mayhem. I'm sure people will be going nuts. It'll be crazy. Oh, dude, I can't wait. I can't wait, man. I want my city back, back away. We fucking drove for you from Maryland. Yeah, fucking I'm snow, so rain, slash rain slash hail, slash in rain. the fucking traffic. I don't give a fuck. We've been here since 2 o'clock trying to get a ticket. I went online, tried to get them online, sold out in minutes, gone. Just sat there, sad silence. It's the only thing I can think of. We gotta ask these guys. You guys have tickets? Nope. All right. I tried to buy a ticket. I almost got fired because after three minutes online with Ticketmaster, the lady said, "No, everything sold out." I kind of pulled the phone out of the thing and chucked it off the wall. And my boss said, "What the fuck did you just do that for?" Uh, the scalpers ate them up and tried to sell them for like five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars. So <laughs> don't worry, it will happen. Yeah, we'll get in there. I didn't even know people were flying on from like Michigan, from Indianapolis, Los Angeles, Liverpool. Come all the way from England. It's the Boston's back together for the throwdown. <laughs> it's got to be done. <laughs> so I can't believe that just happened. Joe Gittleman just walked up and said, Who's looking for a ticket? You, you can have it. So that's why they're the greatest band in the world, man. Other bands have their hot ass fucking like, like, they're like, I'm gonna be in, I'm cooler than you. These guys, the Boston's ain't like that. You know what I'm saying? They're like, they're normal people. Like, they're good guys. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what makes them like, better than everyone. Like, like, they're just like me and you. I've been to this show all nine years, and they're like the only band that after the show, I just remember Dickie Barrett standing at the top of the stairs, shaking everyone's hands, thanking them. What bands do that? Yeah. You know, he, he, uh, I, I'm lost, I, I can't even speak right now. You're going to the throwdown? I am going to the throwdown. <laughs> It feels like we're correcting something that, that, that should have been done. And it's like coming in here and unfinished business and then now we're taking care of unfinished business. I think just hold on to your hats, you know what I mean? They bring it old school, bad and flat. See you in the drunk tank.
I knew this was gonna be fun. I didn't think it would be this much fucking fun. Sincerely, sincerely, we've missed you. This is it right here. Oh God, the left hand <laughs> side. <laughs> Oh my god. The upkeep isn't. <laughs> what, uh. Do you want to... There was a, a whole row of garages here, and there was one down at the end that we practiced at. We ran a, a power cord from my mom's house, which is right here, over the roof of the garages to the thing over there. We practiced there until we got a drummer whose parents wouldn't let him keep his drums there. And then we started practicing in his basement. So that tells you how long ago it was. What is that? This thing here. Is that a shed? This is the new. This house is kind of falling apart. <laughs> look at, look at a, look, get a little shot of that hole. Get this out of the hole. It looks exactly the same. Goodness. Everything is in I like it, Joe. I think it feels like a little time capsule. Let's go in the backyard. I think, Joe, this was your shoestring. <laughs> this is right there. I really, I bet there is stuff we stored in there. And then uh, Higgs lived all the way up the top. Yeah. Just at the time, this was one of the most uh, intricate stair systems in the <laughs> eastern seaboard.
like I said, be careful out there because it's, it's, it's not the sound, it's not the temperature, it's nothing visual that will get you, it's, it's the smells. Yeah. <laughs> that unmistakable odor of the throat out. And we could bottle that scent. <laughs> like some kind of a, you know, like, Boston, throw down. And a little the musty. Throw down. <laughs> Half sneaky <-peaky> guy. <laughs> Big fat frat guy. Throw down. It just takes a while. I mean, even back when we used to do the throw down, it always took a night or two to really hit your stride. Yeah. And that was when we were touring all the time. That was when we were on the road all the time. We were, we were in our tour groove anyway. But yeah. The throwdown is a different animal. It's not a normal show. So it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yes. Jim. Okay, Jim. All right. It's not, a, it's not a sprint, buddy. Okay. Got more than one tape in that camera. You're gonna need it. <laughs>
That was the throwdown. What do you What do you think? Do you have fun? It was It was awesome. It was awesome. Because everybody smelled like an armpit, and well, everybody was just so sweaty, and it was dripping from the ceiling with the sweat and. Kind of gross, but kind of cool. Absolutely insane. It was, it was awesome, though. We had a great Hot, time. sweaty. Loud. Yeah, dripping sweat everywhere. It was like, Hell of a show. Music's changed our lives. Everybody said it was great. I completely fucked up. If you guys were fan, fucking time to us. These guys right here. These guys right here. Steve, I taste just tell I mean, uh, I, I, I saw Bruce Springsteen uh, maybe a month ago. You guys Who's were tighter than fucking fuck Who's Nils Lofgren. You were the boss. The boss. Fuck you. little Steven. Fuck the fuck the boss. This guy's the boss right here, man. This guy's the boss right here. We are not fucking worthy. God damn it. <laughs> Just okay. Hold on. Give me a second. Their white version of the Temptations. <laughs> I mean, it's weird, you know. Like, there's like this five-year period where I have, you know, I see the guys and we speak and everything, and you know, guys got married, guys got divorced, people started on new careers, and then we got back to rehearse, and we were the same bunch of completely retarded idiots that hadn't matured one iota in the entire time. So. There was such a long period, like, I mean, not to get all serious or anything, but like after the, we kind of stopped playing, like, I kind of, it took me like a whole year to kind of decompress, you know, to like get away from being a Boston and like just playing shows all the time, you know, it's like, you kind of dream about it, you know, it's like, it's just like your normal routine and then it just kind of went away. And then it, like, finally you kind of get over it and now here I am doing it again. These are like my brothers. 15 years driving around the world with them, so good to reconnect and realize that no one changed. Everything's still exactly the same. It's like we didn't even miss a beat, which is good. Get back in it and see what what's there, you know. Brings back some old memories. Gets the juices flowing again, you know what I'm saying? I think at this point, if you followed the band for so many years, you know that, that things are gonna happen and we're gonna do stuff eventually and that we like to do stuff and and that there's no answer to anything and that the main thing about this band is we do stuff when we want to do it. I think we're probably going to tour, we're probably going to record some you know, more music, we're going to maybe do another throwdown. Uh, another road to the throwdown. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to start that, we're going to start that in about a half an hour. The boys are tight, they're back at it, God bless them. Yeah! They're the hometown yeah! heroes, baby! Fucking awesome! And the only thing I want to say to Dickie is, let us know when you get to 26. Ah.